Hello and welcome to this video looking at the menus on the Sony AXP33 camcorder and the various different models of AX33, AX35, they're all the same camcorder, just badge different things around the world. But hopefully this video could also be of use to you if you have some other Sony camcorder models as well, as I believe a lot of the menuing system is common across the range. So stay with me and some of it hopefully will be of use even if you don't have the AXP33. Just briefly before I get into the menus, let me have a quick look round the screen and show you what's there. Top left hand corner a button marked menu which obviously takes us to those menus. Bottom left here a playback button so we can go and review our footage. On this model and presumably some others three configurable buttons here on screen which you can set to be whatever you want and I'll come back to that in a bit. The camcorder is telling us we're in standby mode. Over here we've got the battery life and what recording format we're in and then across the bottom some information about for example the audio meters here you can just see them showing a little bit of signal as I talk even though obviously I'm recording this on a different camcorder the microphones in the AX are picking up my voice and it's telling us we're in two channel mode and a shutter speed of 50 for example some of the things that are on screen change according to what menu options you set so let's get into those menus then and there are a lot of them and I don't find them particularly uh, sensibly organized but maybe that's just me now let me be perfectly blunt I'm not going to go through every one of these because we would be here for hours shooting mode for example is either movie, stills, or these sort of slow-mo trick shot things. Well, I'm not going to go into these. They're a bit of a gimmick, really. Equally, if you're taking photos, probably better that you get a stills camera. So I'm going to assume for this video that you want to shoot movies. That is, after all, why you bought a camcorder. Now, one of the annoying things about these menus is when you select a lot of the options, it always takes you straight back out of the menus, and you have to keep clicking menu to get back in there again. So that was shooting mode, equally playback function, that just takes you to reviewing your footage, it's the normal thought sort of thing, you can scroll through different collections of footage, select a day, gives you the clips and you can play them back. I don't think really we need to say anything more about that. So let's go into menu again, actually I'll just switch back into camcorder mode because for some reason when you go into menu from playback it gives you a different set of options and that's something to watch out for. Edit copy, I'm not really going to talk about because that's to do with mucking about with the files on the card and it's much easier to do all that uh, in a computer if you want to copy the files and ultimately just format the card when you put it back in the camcorder when you want to uh, start afresh. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. Wireless settings, that really is a separate video all of its own. It's not something I'm going to touch on in this one. So apologies if you were tuning in hoping for the wireless configuration. I think that really needs to be done in a different video. So the three we're going to look at are the camera and mic settings, which are all sorts of recording settings you'll use while filming, the image quality size settings, which you'll pre-configure before you go out filming, and there is a bit of setup you can do before you even do anything else at all. So we'll start with that one. Now a lot of this, by and large, you can ignore, and I'll just scroll back up to the top of the menus. But some of it is useful, I mean, media info, click on that, you click on memory card, it's telling me the various recording times I have available with the card I've got in there at the moment. But that's nothing really that it didn't tell me from that screen that you saw at the beginning when we were looking at filming. Format is obviously the most useful one here I would suggest. When you format the memory card it wipes it and makes it completely blank ready to start again. I'm not going to do that, I've got some useful footage on here I don't want to get rid of but that is where you would format your card. Repair your image database files, you should hope never to need to use that because that means something's gone horribly wrong. File number is to do with how the camcorder numbers the um, different files when you press start stop recording and you can reset the series here if you want to and make it start from zero again at the moment mine's just been counting up ever since I bought the camcorder data code I have this off it's to do whether it shows you the date and time overlaid onto the uh, pictures in playback mode only I don't think it's actually um, embedding it onto the footage as a date stamp um, but that's just whether you want to see it when you're playing footage back. I tend to have that switched off, I'm not that interested in uh, the date. Volume, obviously, for playback. 
Um, I always tend to have mine at max because I always find these things rather too quiet. But if you want to reduce it, you press the button on the left. If you want to turn it up, button on the right. And when you're done, press OK. Motion interval adjust. Frankly, I don't know anything about it. Um, I think it's to do with time lapses, but I wouldn't absolutely swear to it and I've never used it. So I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to gloss over that one. Scroll down to the next. This is telling the camcorder what sort of TV you have if you want to plug the camcorder into a telly for playback. So if it's a 16 by 9 widescreen, whether, what the resolution is over the HDMI. By and large, just leave everything in auto. Here is my advice. It makes things a lot easier. One thing you may wish to turn off is the beep. If you have the beep set to on every time you touch anything on the screen, it beeps. It's really annoying. So turn that off. Monitor brightness. If you don't have it bright, you're not going to see it shooting outside in daylight, so that's definitely worth uh, turning up. The keystone adjustment is only for projector models, and it's to do with the way that the projector projects. I'll simplify it like that. Leave it set to auto. Recording lamp. Do you want the little light lighting up when you press record? Some people like to have it. Um, some people like to do stealth filming with the rec light off, but that's a bit pervy in my book, so I would leave the rec lamp set to on. Obviously here, language English. 24p mode. This camcorder does the normal for the UK, 25 and 50. If you're in the States, it's 30, 60. But it will also record the filmic looking 24p. In other words, shooting 24 progressive frames a second like cine film does. Weirdly, this is not in the menus where all the other settings are regarding what format you're shooting in. It's entirely separate and for some reason, you have to reformat the card and reboot the camcorder. It's some major exercise to change it into 24p mode. Can't imagine why, but it is, and that's how you get to it. And I'm, again, not going to reformat my card here. The calibration is simply to calibrate the touch screen. Battery info gives you a nice picture of how your battery is looking, and I'm hoping that's going to last the duration of this uh, explainer. Power save mode. If you have that on standard or max, it will dim the screen every now and again. It'll even turn the camcorder off after a while if you haven't used it to save power. Obviously, I've turned it off for the purposes of doing this video because I don't want it switching itself off while I'm trying to talk about it. Initialize will actually reset the camera to its default settings, which again, I don't want to do. But if you get in a muddle and find it all getting a bit uh, bizarre, you can press initialize, it'll put it back where it was. Demo mode is something they just use when they're putting these camcorders in the shops. And version tells me that I have version 1.0 of the camcorder's internal software. So I should probably check to see if there's been any updates on that. And that is your setup menu. Let's go into image quality and size then. And here we're going to define which sort of mode we want to film in. Now this particular camcorder does 4K footage, it does HD footage in XAVCS, which is a high bitrate, super duper HD codec, and it also does good old fashioned AVCHD. Weirdly, the format you're shooting is actually the fourth item down, but as you can see, you have got those choices I just mentioned. AVCHD, um, old fashioned I suppose now, I remember once when it was all the rage, XAVCS HD, high bitrate, super duper quality HD, and 60 megabit 4K on this particular camcorder. I'll leave it on the AVC HD just for the moment. Go on. And having selected AVC HD or any of those other formats, some or all or none of these may be illuminated for you to change. So uh, the different formats have different levels of configurability. In AVC HD, for example, you can choose whether you want it in um, a sort of high quality or less quality mode. It also reminds you that you can't take stills in the FX mode, which is the high quality. So if I wanted to, sorry, highest quality, high quality, I could change it down there. 17 megabits a second, highest quality. Yes, stop telling me about the stills. Highest quality, 24 megabits. Um, and I think that's either 50i or 25p. And it's taken us out of the menus again, which is very irritating when it does that. Now the frame rate, as I suggested, you could do 25, 50p, 50i, that's the old television standard. If you're in the States, these will all be 30, 60. If you're in a PAL country, that is most of Europe, Japan I think is PAL, um, Australia, New Zealand, you get the 25 and 50 settings. 
dual video recording is whether it will simultaneous to your main recording make a little low quality um, sort of proxy version I suppose which is something you might want to upload to Twitter or, or probably not YouTube but Instagram one of the sort of media sharing sites I don't really use it I tend to take my full quality footage edit it in the computer and then upload to YouTube and share the YouTube link file format we've talked about image size is what size you want the still images to be if you take a photo while filming and your options can be limited here depending on what you've um, set in these other options so as I say sometimes you select one thing and other options will become inaccessible or they will change because various options aren't available depending on what settings you've set if that makes sense and that pretty much is the image quality and size menu item so the main one then and if you haven't already got a cup of tea and a biscuit I would suggest you get one at this point because this is going to take a while this has many many options for us starting at the top with white balance this is effectively if you don't know telling your camera what the color white looks like under different types of lighting so if you are under a nice bright blue sky it's a it's a blue sort of light it's about sort of five six six thousand degrees kelvin if you're indoors under tungsten lighting it's around 3200 degrees kelvin and it will look more yellow now our eyes adjust naturally to that you have to tell the camcorder or you can as I have here left it in auto so it's got an auto setting it's got a preset for outdoor and you can see how the image behind has all gone a sort of yellowy color it's got a preset for um, indoor which is that tungsteny sort of light we're under a mix here of part daylight more daylight I'd say than indoor which is why everything's now gone very slightly bluer but you can also do a custom white balance and tell it exactly what white looks like so you select one push fill the screen with something white and forgive me while I just zoom in on it fill the screen with something white and then you press this set button it has a think and in fact is that looking white to you it's possibly looking slightly yellow to me let's make it do it again no it's definitely happy with that but um, when you zoom the camera back out again and take the white away everything on screen should look the right color now to me I think that's all looking a little bit yellow but there's actually a way we can correct that further on in the menus For the, um, I might just leave it back on auto I suppose no I tell you what I will leave it there I'll leave it there looking slightly yellow and we'll, we'll get to the menus so we now have three options spot meter focus spot meter and spot focus for setting the exposure and the focus by touching things on the screen if you go spot meter focus then whatever you touch on the screen the camcorder will set both the focus and the exposure if you choose the spot meter it will simply set the exposure and spot focus fairly obviously it'll set the focus so let me just demonstrate by pressing spot meter focus if I touch something very bright and very close because it's very bright it's dimmed the image down but it's also brought that into focus you'll notice the background is now out of focus if I touch something very dark and far away it brings the image up because it's trying to make the, the exposure right for that very dark area it's also now got that in focus and although you may not be able to see it because it's so bright the nearby bottle has now gone out of focus so you can if you like use this when filming very quickly you spot something you like touch it and the camera will instantly set the focus and the exposure for that if you prefer you could simply set the metering of the exposure or the metering of the uh, focus now if you don't want to muck around with touching things on the screen but would rather the camcorder just looked at the scene and made its own decisions well then you can choose to muck about with these options instead so for example exposure come on if we set that to auto the camcorder is now looking at the scene as a whole rather than specifically the bottle here or the bag there it's just looking at the scene as a whole and trying to set what it thinks is the right average exposure for the scene as a whole that may or may not be what you want but actually it generally does a pretty good job 
Now equally, focus on this camcorder, it's got a focus ring on the front, but you could put that into auto, and now the camcorder will try to work out which thing you want in focus. And here, it's actually got the bottle in focus and everything in the background uh, is slightly defocused because it's seeing the bottle as the nearest thing and therefore probably what you want to be in focus. Sometimes this can be a nuisance, hence why the spot metering where you touch the screen to tell it what you want can be quite useful. Or, of course, on this camcorder, you put it into manual and twiddle the focus ring but you may not necessarily have that option. So equally with focus and iris, now this, this is a weird thing about Sony camcorders. To me, exposure is setting the iris and shutter speed and gain. But on a Sony camcorder, exposure is just some mystical thing that the camcorder does with the iris and shutter speed and gain, but doesn't actually tell you what it's doing. So when you tell it to do auto exposure, the camcorder is making up a combination of the iris and the shutter speed and the gain to what it thinks is best. As a filmmaker and camcorder user who likes a bit more control, I don't particularly like that. I would rather just set specific things, but for reasons we'll come to in a minute, this camcorder, and presumably lots of Sony others, makes it very difficult. For example, shutter speed. If I'm filming 25p, 50p, normally set a shutter speed of 1 50th. If you go above that or below that, your video either starts looking blurry because the shutter speed is too long, or it looks really staccato and stuttery because the shutter speed is too short. So by and large for video, 1 50th is right. So let us say we want to set this to 1 50th. Oops, just knock that. There we go. 150th. Okay, we're happy with that. Back into the menus, and now let's say I want to set my iris manually as well. So I go into iris, manual, and there are the usual F numbers, F1.8, nice wide open, and we can close it down, F3.7. Now you might think that having set that to F3.7, and a moment ago set the, the shutter to 150th, they'd both be as they were set, but no, because look, the shutter speed has gone to auto because we changed the iris to manual. And I don't know if it's an exclusive thing on this camcorder or all of Sony's camcorders, but you can only set one aspect of the exposure properly manually, and the camcorder is still going to do all the others on its own. So if you set shutter speed to 1 50th, iris will go into auto. If you set iris to a specific F value, the shutter speed will go into auto. Effectively, you have no actual manual control because the camcorder is always going to be doing the other elements of the exposure on its own. It is the most extraordinary, annoying, frustrating system. I can sort of see why Sony did it because it's a camcorder after all for the general public to use and by and large, the general public does point and shoot, but that's why you have auto settings. If the general public want to put it in auto, let it do auto. But if I, as an enthusiast camcorder user, want to put it into manual, for goodness sake, Sony, let me put it into manual. But you can't. Again, if I put the shutter speed back, I'll show you, back under 1 50th. OK. We go back into the menus. You'll notice the iris has gone back to auto. And you, you can only have one of these things set manually, otherwise it does the lot. If you set exposure to manual, you can turn the exposure up and down manually, but you don't actually know whether it's opening the iris or changing the shutter speed. It's, it's infuriating. What I tend to do is have the shutter speed fixed because I know I want it at 1 50th, and leave the iris in auto and then there is a way we'll come to in a second, which allows you to adjust it fractionally, but not with any great degree of precision, but it's the best you can get. 
Now, AGC limit is the auto gain control. When you're in very dark environments, the camcorder will have to add electronic amplification, gain, or ISO, if you're used to it from a stills background, it'll try to add some gain to the image. The trouble with gain is gain brings noise into the image as well. Now, sometimes that's unavoidable. You're in a very dark situation, you want the image, well, you're gonna to have to add some gain. But generally, you don't. So you can tell the camcorder, if you prefer, don't add any more than 9, 6, or 3, or even no dB of gain at all. Of course, you may find that if you do say, don't add any, the scene becomes so dark, you have to add extra light. And by and large, that's no bad thing. Now, as this is a point-and-shoot camcorder, I accept that there are going to be situations where I can't add light. I'm just going to be wandering around filming stuff, but I don't really like the level of noise you get on 9, so I tend myself to set it to six. It's still very noisy in dark situations, but what can you do? It's a small censored camcorder. Now a moment ago I mentioned there's a way you can slightly compensate the exposure for whatever the camera is doing in its auto settings, and this is it, the AE shift. Come on. If you turn it on, you get a very limited degree of saying to the camera, well, I see what you've done with the exposure, but I'd rather have it a bit darker. Or, turning it up, saying, I'd rather have it a bit lighter. And so I have the shutter speed manually fixed, rigidly set to 1 50th, let it do its auto exposure, and then just use this to slightly fine tune whether I like the look of whatever it's doing. And that is the only degree of control, really, you have over the exposure in manual mode on this camcorder. I do wish it would stop taking me out of the menus. Equally, you can do the same with the white balance shift. Now, I was mentioning this when we set that auto white balance. I think everything's looking a bit yellow in the, in the um, preset white balance, so we should be able to tweak the colours a bit. Although I have a feeling if we go more to the right, it actually makes it more yellow, and I want it less yellow. That looks quite white to me. I don't know how it's going to show up since I'm filming this on another camera, and then obviously you are watching it on your screen, but to me, that now looks white. So clearly the, the sort of default setting, which would be in the middle, a little bit yellow, can turn it down a bit, and I'm happy with that. So for some reason our custom white balance didn't give me exactly white, but I can tweak it a little bit and get it how I want it looking. Now low lux mode, by and large, stay away from this. There will be occasions when you are desperate to get a shot, I suppose, and you will do anything, even if it looks horrid. But basically, low lux mode kicks in a load of gain into the image and makes it look grainy and noisy and horrid, but it will get you a picture. So if you're desperate, you can turn that mode on. Scene selection, bit of a gimmick, this one, really. Uh, sorry, I've pressed the wrong button. Big fat fingers. Scene selection is a way of saying to the camcorder, uh, you know the kind of thing, oh, I'm filming at night, or I'm filming a landscape, or I'm filming this or that, fireworks, or there we go, there's landscape. And it changes various settings within the camcorder to try and make them right for what you're filming. I don't use it. I'd rather set the settings myself because you just don't know whether it really is making the settings right. Have a fiddle with it, see if you like it. I tend to leave it on auto, but because then I have most of the rest of the camcorder settings on manual, um, my settings triumph. Picture effect, which I accidentally clicked on, this really is gimmicky, allows you to apply sort of posterization effects or pop color effects. It's horrid, it's horrid. You really wouldn't be doing this because it records it like that in the camera and then you're stuck with it. You can't take it off when you get the footage off the camera. If you film it looking like that or like that, that's how it's filmed, horrid. So better to do it in editing. Just film it neutral with picture effects off and uh, if you want to add special effects, do it afterwards in your computer with editing. Likewise, the cinema tone, which if you turn it on, makes everything a bit more contrasty and also turns the saturation up. I don't know if this will come through again. We've got a very uh, good bit of colour here. And if I turn that off, well, you can certainly see the image going brighter, but it's also saturating the colours in a slightly different way as well. 
Again, by and large, I'd record with that off. If you want to change the colours afterwards, do it in your editing program, which almost certainly has ways and means of doing that. Fader. Who uses a fader these days? You touch fader and it gives the uh, gives you the option of fading the image to black or white or fading it up from black or white when you start filming or stop filming. Again, it's the kind of thing surely you do while editing. Surely nobody these days is composing their movie as they shoot in the camcorder so that it's all kind of ready and done once once they've finished filming. You would normally just shoot it, bring the footage into even a moderate PC these days, and edit it there. So I'm going to ignore fader, but it, it fades to black, fades to white, or fades up from black or white when you press the start, stop, record but button. It's a gimmick. So most of that page of options were gimmicks. Now you can see here that we've got a couple of options greyed out. I did mention earlier, depending what things you'd set, um, options do get changed. But as it happens, the top one's a self-timer for photographs anyway. I'm not too bothered about that. And the middle one is a steady shot for photographs, still photos that is, and again, not too bothered. What you really like, particularly on the AX33 camera, is the stabilisation. This particular model has the balanced optical stabilisation system where the entire lens assembly is floated in a little gimbal inside the camera. It is superb. Of all the Handycam camcorder stabilisation systems, the Boss system from Sony, by far and away the best I've ever seen. Now you can turn it off if you want to. If you're on a tripod and you don't need it, turn it off and that's fine. Standard mode does a pretty good job, I have to tell you. And Sony says here, clear image zoom will be turned off. Now clear image zoom is a sort of digital zoom that Sony try to market not as a digital zoom because everyone knows digital zoom is horrible, but that's kind of what it is. It's cropping in on the pixels on the sensor because it's got so many pixels on the sensor. Now, with standard stabilization, this whole clear image zoom is turned off. If you go to active, which is the sort of highest quality of stabilization, the clear image zoom gets turned on. On my experiments on another of Sony camcorders, Sony's camcorders, that has clear image zoom, I found the image to be very slightly degraded even if you weren't zooming, if you had the clear image zoom turned on. It shouldn't be, but it was. But if you want the sort of highest strength stabilization, you have to live with that. It's fractional, this slight degradation of the image, very fractional. But if you can get away with standard stabilization and the clear image zoom off, you should get a slightly crisper image. Back out of the menus again. Digital zoom, let's not go there. It's something ridiculous like, there we go, 120 times digital zoom. It's just toy town rubbish. I mean, it'll just pixelate the image horribly. Go closer to what you're filming. Don't bother with digital zoom. It's, it's really not worth it. Auto backlight, I don't find this works at all. Supposedly, it sets a compensation for if you're filming someone who is backlit so as to stop them being silhouetted. It doesn't really work in my book. The manual ring setting, this is to do with the, the physical ring on the front of the camera that you can twist and you can set it to have various functions. It can be the manual focus, it can be the uh, iris, it can be the dreaded exposure where you don't know what the camcorder is doing. By and large, I would leave it on focus, uh, but obviously it's your choice, but that's what I have it set to. The night shot light, this camcorder has a sort of infrared filming mode, and if you want to help it with its infrared filming, you can turn the little infrared light on. It doesn't make a lot of difference, if I'm perfectly honest, but it's nice to have it there, I suppose. Face detection. If you're trying to do a vloggy type thing where you point the camcorder at yourself, it can be quite helpful to have the face detection turned on and when it spots a face and it's filming it puts a sort of square over it in the uh, in the viewfinder not on the actual recording obviously but it shows that it's found a face by putting a square at it and then it tries to focus and expose on that face very handy if you are doing selfie filming on one of these camcorders the next two options smile shutter and sensitivity gimmicks again in my book the camcorder is actually looking to see if the face is smiling and if it is it quickly snaps a still photo. Well, again, I think you're better off taking stills with a stills camera, but if you want that kind of thing. Flash, obviously, to do with stills. 
Now we get into something a bit more interesting, which is the audio. And of course, audio is critical to good video. At the top option, my voice cancelling, you can turn this on or off. And in theory, the camcorder tries to listen to sounds coming from behind the camera, in other words, by the person operating it, and erase them from the recording in preference for sounds coming from the front of the camcorder. Again, I tried this function on um, another of Sony's camcorders. It doesn't work. It's, it's, a, it's a gimmick. It's a nice idea, but it's really not worth it. I would just leave it switched off and tell your camera operator to shut up if you don't want to hear them. The auto wind noise reduction on or off. In theory, that gets rid of the sort of um, this kind of noise you get when you're filming outdoors. Doesn't work. I've never found a camcorder where electronic wind noise reduction actually works. They tend to be just um, a low cut filter. And really, if you want to get rid of wind noise, you need to put a proper fluffy wind jammer over the microphones and that will do a much better job than that. So ignore that. Audio mode depends on which filming mode you're in. So if you're in AVC HD, you get the option on this camcorder of 5.1 surround or stereo. If you're in the 4K mode, it's purely stereo. And I think the same is true on the XAVCS, it's purely stereo. But if you've chosen AVC HD, you can have surround sound if you want. And finally, thank you, Sony. This is always very, very welcome. Manual audio recording levels, because when you put these things into auto, um, it always overcompensates. They tend to bring the volume up and then crush it massively uh, just before it distorts. And it sounds horrible. And also, I mean, you can see here I am just talking away, not to the camcorder itself, just near it. And you can see the levels are absolutely getting smashed. And I'm not talking particularly loudly. Now, they're almost getting smashed right at the top there. The camcorder will do a little bit of compression on it to stop it distorting. But if you stop talking and it's all quiet, the camcorder brings the levels up. Then you start talking, suddenly it's massively loud and it brings them all down again. And you just get a mishmash of a sort of horrible compressed pumping sound. You get hiss. Always much better if you can put them onto manual. But beware. Let's show you something. If I turn this manual setting down, so I've brought the little yellow blob all the way over here. Briefly put it back into auto. Don't touch anything. Put it back into manual again. Look, it's put the flipping thing all the way back over there again. So watch out for that. If you accidentally or intentionally go into auto, next time you go into manual, it will have put it back over there. Now, the best way to set your levels on these camcorders is start from as quiet as you possibly can. You can see I'm not even registering on the meters now. And then bring the levels up. Never start from high and bring them down because many of these camcorders have little compressors on them that will give you a, a sort of pseudo readout. And you think you're getting a good level, but actually you're getting a very compressed level. It's a whole different subject. I did make a video about it on Sony's um, CX100. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. But start from quiet and bring the levels up until such time as, and this is crucial, not so much that the average level of speech is visible. What you really want to level on is peak values. So when someone starts a sentence or hello, they say hello, and it'll be a loud huh, or Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Those will all be loud. And it's those sounds you need to catch and make sure that aren't getting too loud because then they will distort. So set the levels, checking by doing individual words as if you were starting a sentence and those will always be the peak words so hello and welcome to the vlog now you can see the hello is crashing right into the edge there so hello and welcome to this video but then as i keep on talking the levels are not actually crashing quite so much i think that's a bit loud i'll turn that down so let's try again hello and welcome to this video Arguably still a bit loud because on the hello, it was crashing right into the right hand side. Hello and welcome to this video. Yeah, I think that's probably about right. You can see for yourself, it's a bit of trial and error. You'll also need to listen back to the recordings afterward and just get a feel for what the levels on this, how they relate to the recorded sound. But you really want to set it so that the peaks don't go crashing into overload. Don't worry so much about ordinary everyday speech. As you can see now, those levels might look a bit quiet, 
but they're quiet enough that if I did suddenly make a loud sound, it wouldn't overload. Sound is a whole complicated thing, but if you can adjust the levels manually, you'll have a much better recording at the end of it. Right, there's a bit more to go. We're nearly at the bottom. Now, you remember when we first looked around the screen, there were three buttons down the side, and I said you can assign those to what you want. Here's where you do it on the My Button function. You've got a list of all the different functions that the camcorder can do, and you've got the three positions. And essentially, as it says, select the button you want to register. So find something you want, like audio recording level, and select the registration destination. In other words, which of these three buttons do you want audio rec level assigned to? I've already got it there, but I'm going to put it there again. And there you go. My choice of audio record levels is now set to that button. And you can set these three as you want. As you can see, I've got the exposure compensation, very handy. I've got my white balance setting, very handy, and my recording levels, very handy. So if I just go back into the main screen as if I was filming. Let's say I'm about to set up a shot. The camera, obviously, as we know, is doing its own exposure. If I don't like what it's doing, I can just hit that button, turn on my auto uh, exposure compensation, and turn it down a bit. Great. Now I don't like the white balance, so I set that, and I can instantly pick the white balance or do a preset. And perhaps I'm doing an interview. I can instantly hit that and get into the audio levels. Your choice of those, obviously, will be whichever ones you think are most useful to have quickly at hand, because if they're not on those buttons, obviously you have to go through the menus and find them. So it's quite useful having those three. Focus magnifier turned on is a rather cunning system where if you have a camcorder with a focus ring on it, like the AXP33, as you turn the focus, the camcorder zooms up the image, not on the recording, just on the screen, to give you a better view of what you're focusing at by effectively sort of zooming into it a bit digitally. And we know digital zoom is horrible, but in this instance it's useful. And it allows you to see what you're focusing on much more clearly. So I tend to have focus magnifier on. Once you let go of the focus ring, after a couple of seconds, it disappears and drops back to the normal view. Grid lines, if you turn them on, and go back to the thing, as you can see it's now given you this little grid of squares, and the idea is that it helps you compose your shot, because there is some sort of artistic theory, it's the rule of thirds, that says that you should put the interesting things along those lines or on the intersections. So, for example, you'll notice most television interviews have the person's eye line on that top third, and if it is an interview, their head will be on that intersection looking that way, or that intersection looking that way. Equally, if you're doing a landscape, you'll probably find the landscape is roughly along that bottom third line. And just having those grid lines on screen helps you line your footage up if you are not experienced enough to do it without the grid lines. I've been shooting for enough years that I don't want the grid lines, so I turn them off, and you just look at it and work out where the points are and where it looks well composed. But if you're a novice, that can be quite helpful. Finally, display setting on or auto just means whether it will keep, let's get to it, all this information showing all the time. I like having it on all the time. If you don't, if you put it on auto, it shows it for a bit and then turns it off. And then when you touch the screen, it brings it back on again. And if you don't touch the screen, it turns it back off again so that you can just see the image you're shooting without all this clutter. I quite like the clutter because I like seeing what the camera is set to at all times. Is that the lot? No. A couple of final things. The zebra bars. Terrific to have zebra shooting on a camcorder because zebras show you to what degree certain parts of the image are exposed. If you select 70 here and you see these black and white zebra bars showing on that, you know that those parts of the image are at 70% reflectance. And that's helpful because, for example, Caucasian skin tones typically reflect at 70. So if you line someone up for an interview and had the 70% zebra bar setting and their face was showing a few zebra bars, you know that they're exposed correctly. This is all very well and good, except that as we've already discussed in this camera, you can't really change the exposure properly 
without the camcorder doing mysterious things under the hood that you don't really know about. So it's a bit of a wasted thing having the zebras because there's not a lot you can do about it. Yes, you can put the camcorder onto manual exposure and turn it down, but as we've already explained, you don't quite know how it's doing that turn down. Is it the iris? Is it the gain? Is it the shutter speed? And if you don't want those meddled with unknowingly, then exposure is largely an auto, in which case knowing that things are at 100% or 70% is a bit of a waste of time. So it was a nice idea to include it, Sony, but without full manual exposure, it's a bit of a waste of time. Peaking can be useful if you're doing manual focus. You select white, red or yellow, and the camera will put a little white, red or yellow line around the things in the image that it thinks are sharp. So while you're focusing, as you change the focus, different bits of the image will um, light up with those lines around them. So it just helps you get focus. It can be distracting though, so it is helpful to have it um, able to be turned off. And finally, audio level display is simply turning on or off, whether you want the audio levels switched on. Now, since audio is a critical part of video making, as I'm sure you're aware, and for anyone who's using manual level controls, you definitely want the audio level showing on screen so you have a quick reference to what's going on and of course wearing headphones as well so you can hear it. I think that is the last option. Yes it is, so there we go, a bit of a mammoth session there, but that is the menus on the Sony AXP33, the AX33, I think there's an AX30 version, an AX35 version and probably many more Sony camcorders besides. I really hope this was useful to you. I know it was quite long-winded, but if it was, give the video a click on the like button if you're logged into YouTube, uh, if you'd be so kind. If you have any questions, comments, anything like that, drop them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.